Good morning, everybody. How are you doing on this fine Thursday? All right. Um, so, how was the uh, exam on Tuesday? You feel okay with it? You felt prepared? Awesome. Um, and you all hopefully got back your essays, uh, if you were there for the exam. Uh, all right. Um, just sort of as a class, how do you feel about your essay grades? It, it may be that there's a, I think that you were, you were in the first batch because you were with a D, so I graded yours. So I don't know. Uh, I'll look into it. Uh, Antonio. Okay. Um, Mr. Higgins is not here right now, so uh, I'm not sure where he is. I think he might, he, maybe he's sick, or I'm not sure. So uh, we'll figure it out. If your, if your essay is not in your hands, uh, come see me or email me, and we'll be sure you get your essay. Um, those of you who have your essay, uh, you feel like you have a grade that you deserved? Okay. Um, I think that hopefully we'll see a little bit of improvement, um, having had a chance to do a dry run with the first essay. Uh, lots of comments, um, get more sort of familiar with the rubric as well. So hopefully that will help you if you want to do uh, a different kind of work or perform better on the next one you can. But overall, I think most of the grades were in the B's and the A's. So that's good. It flex well on you uh, and it shows that you've done a good job with the material. Uh, okay, so what I want to do now is I want to think about uh, back actually to our reading, had you guys read a book um, by Shiro Goro, he was talking about his experience, uh, his recollections of, of the, the fall of Aizu Castle, and these kinds of things. He, towards the end, uh, one of the changes happening in Japan that none of you decided to focus on, I don't think, um, at least not in my, my bunch, uh, was the... Uh, dawn of Japanese imperialism. And I thought it would be so much fun if I could just connect that reading with today's class. So here comes uh, an attempt to do that. On page 132, this is kind of like a quiz with no grade. So um, this, is, uh, this sentence appears uh, in Shibagoro's uh, recollections. He recalled Sagata Takamori, uh, who was hoping to invade a certain place. I was overruled and resigned. So between recalling that page and thinking about today's readings, what country was Sagatakamori hoping to invade? Uh, uh, I can see your name. It's not Andrew. Um, with a D? All right, say it. Tell me your name. Matthew. OK. Matthew, yes. Korea. Korea. So Korea is the answer to that one. All right. So we'll, Today we're going to discuss Korea. The other one I want to also, on the next page actually, um, talk about along the same, uh, the same lines, Japanese troops had invaded a certain country and he uh, goes to the Genza, right, the glitzy new brick building district uh, in Tokyo uh, and his classmates and he are looking at a woman who's an aborigine, which I misspelled there, sorry, aborigine, who's uh, on display, she's been taken captive. Uh, it's the same country as the Japanese have invaded. What country is that? No, uh, although this country uh, was sort of unofficially a part of China. Uh, Nash, sorry, Cash, yes. Um, yes, this is Taiwan. So, uh, Taiwan is the country we're talking about here. So I want us to figure out how we got here. Right? Japan uh, is an isolated country. Right? It, it's, it's close to the rest of the world. So how do we end up with uh, an empire that by 1937 expands uh, all the way into Burma and down to Indonesia uh, and up into Korea uh, and Manchuria? So it all begins, uh, we, if we think about back to the close country, I want us to poke some holes in that, in that title. Um, so back in the... Edo period, Japan was a closed country, aside from, as you, as you recall, Dejima, right, the island uh, in, the, in the harbor of Nagasaki, sort of over here-ish, right, over here. But it also, 
I was not close to the rest of Asia. So we talked about um, the China trade being uh, carried on by the Portuguese and then uh, by the Dutch. The Taiwanese had more direct contact with uh, both the Taiwanese and the uh, people of uh, the, the Ryukyu Islands, which are here, uh, and with Korea. So I want to just um, do some background that you haven't probably had uh, on that um, in our sort of whirlwind tour of the Edo period. So um, the daimyo in the Edo period had a lot of autonomy, especially those that, had, um, that were able to make a lot of money off of commerce. Uh, and two daimyo in particular that did very well um, were, first of all, the, the So family uh, on the island of Tsushima, which is here in the um, Korea Strait. This family was in charge of the trade with Korea. So essentially, this little island uh, had one uh, family carrying trade on with Korea, uh, between, between Korea and Japan. Uh, essentially, um, Japanese copper and silver and, sul and, and sulfur were being uh, taken to Korea. And uh, um, also sometimes Chinese, Chinese, Chinese um, goods also came through Korea to Japan, but they all had to pass through Tsushima. And in the other direction, uh, the Koreans were exporting uh, cotton and porcelain to Japan. So this was a very lucrative uh, sort of trade interaction that was happening. Uh, it was maintained throughout the Edo period, and it grew. Uh, probably the, the two wealthiest families from trade um, among them was the, the So family. So this was happening, right? Uh, and part of, what, what, part of what's required for this to, to go into the function is that the, the Koreans have to buy into Japan as its own sort of mini China. So to go to China uh, and trade, you have to go be part of their sphere of influence. You have to go and present gifts to the emperor or to an ambassador. You have to show that you buy into their worldview, right? And, and that China, as the symbol for China uh, demonstrates, it, it's the middle kingdom, it's the center of the world, right? So Japan had its own ambitions to be the center of the world, even back in the Edo period. They wanted the Koreans to, to come to, to Japan as well, um, frequently with, uh, for, for major events, uh, a new shogun being named, for example, to congratulate the shogun, uh, bring gifts, and show goodwill. So this was happening, uh, and this maintains the, the trade between Korea uh, and Japan. Uh, okay, other uh, important kingdom that's uh, involved in, in the same kind of trade, trade uh, relationship is, is Ryukyu. Uh, today, uh, it is Japan and, and Okinawa. Uh, and in this, in this case, it was the family Shimazu, down in Kagoshima, who had uh, the mandate to trade with the, the, the islanders of Ryukyu. It's kind of far from Japan, as you can see on the map, Ryukyu, right? It's not next door. Um, but this was uh, essentially Japan's window on Southeast Asia and also on some Chinese goods coming from, from Fuzhou and in in sort of Southeast China. Uh, so Chinese goods come, uh, goods come from, from, from Southeast Asia as well. Uh, I to, this is a list here, um, a lot of uh, metallurgy uh, things being, being transported, a lot of uh, luxury items as well as medicines uh, and textiles are coming from this through this trade through, through, the, through the, the, the islands of Ryukyu. And this is actually its own, they're, they're, it's a kingdom. They have their own uh, king, they have a capital, they have a castle, right? They have a, it's not a part of Japan at all. Um, but as you can imagine, through these ties over two centuries to Japan, uh, they develop stronger and stronger uh, links to Japan. Antonio? Um, do you know how, how long it would take? Um, I think it's. A, I think it was about two or three days. It wasn't that far, um, but Japanese navigation was not uh, their strong suit, and so it was a perilous voyage. Um, but yeah, it wasn't. It wasn't. Uh, it wasn't that far in terms of uh, the time. I think about three days. What I've, I've read a, a, a few places. So the, the missions. To the, so the the kingdom of Ryukyu also has to be part of Japan's uh, sphere of influence. They have to go and buy in. They have to bring presents. Uh, as well to sort of curry favor with the Japanese, um, and they do so. Uh, this is a, uh, a print from the 1830s of a mission from Ryukyu uh, coming to celebrate, uh, I think it was uh, a recent uh, shogunal accession, naming a new shogun. 
Um, you know, so they're well dressed. They come in large groups, and this is another one in, back in the in the 1700s. Uh, this is sort of traditional Ryukyuan costume on display. Uh, so it was kind of a chance for Japan to see the other, you know, the other to see Japan up close. Uh, this is the same image, but the other half of the image with uh, the ambassador um, seated up high. So I mentioned these two uh, external parts of Japan, uh, these external parts of Japan's sphere of influence because um, both uh, have ties to Japan, and they're both going to be called upon uh, throughout the other period to, to maintain these ties and to see Japan as their center, or at least to, to sort of pay lip, lip service to that to that idea. So as we get into Japan's modern imperial ambitions, uh, these ties are sort of the foundation for uh, imperial aspirations as well, uh, expansion. And last I want to mention Hokkaido, which is uh, a bit more complicated, uh, but also much closer. So in the history of Japan, Hokkaido has been uh, a far away uh, country sort of in the far north, uh, a no man's land, so to speak, um, as though it should have a uh, um, a macron, a long macron over the O, but uh, it's it was a country that, that, that was far away. Um, people living on uh, on Ezo, um, where it comes to Hokkaido, uh, were not Japanese uh, ethnically, uh, and sometimes because they were sometimes very fierce uh, and good at fighting, they would uh, create havoc for the Japanese along, along Japan's uh, Honshu's northern borders. Um, so they were a presence that was well known. Uh, they sort of creeped down in northern Honshu, and part of the unification of Japan uh, back in the sort of seven and eight hundreds involves pushing these people back out of Honshu towards Ezo. But anyway, it's far away. Uh, only as Japan begins as population right to grow uh, in the Edo period do we see a massive expansion and look for more land, right? And uh, Ezo is there. It's not that far away, in fact, in terms of uh, getting there by land. And so this becomes uh, part of Japan's expansion even before uh, imperialism is, 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 is called that in Japan. Um, the people living in uh, Ezo um, were the Ainu. The Ainu, as you can see here, uh, they have uh, ethically more in common with um, Russians than with the Japanese. Uh, they speak a different language. They have a different cosmology. Uh, it's not a Japanese culture at all. Um, they, uh, it, it appears that they had, they, they, these people have been in, uh, had, had been in uh, parts of Japan going back to the Jomon period, so way back to before the Common Era. Um, they are just a different kind of people. They have a different lifestyle, a uh, different diet, uh, et cetera, uh, and they're very hairy. Um, dark hair or red hair, uh, to provide the Ainu. As Japan began to expand, um, and as the mining industry in particular becomes more connected uh, through Osaka and Edo, um, the search for more land for farming uh, grows a bit. But the, the biggest growth uh, are in two areas, of fishing and in mining. Uh, and Ezo is just sort of there for the taking. It's not highly populated. The, uh, there are probably a few hundred thousand I living on this big uh, island. Japanese were living, you know, uh, several million on a, on a relatively small, right, um, and arable uh, space in their part of Japan. So expansion, I think, in some ways was probably inevitable, at least the clash between the two. Um, so Japanese gold uh, and copper mining expands to the north. The shogun gives out a special uh, um, um, charters for companies. Uh, they have their own, actually, their own mine as well that they open. Um, in Matsumai in the far north of Japan, and they're allowed to go and trade with the Ainu and to establish uh, and settle and mine uh, in the very southern part of Hokkaido or, or Ezo. And this grows over a century and a half or so, um, and so that mining and copper, copper and, and gold mining do uh, come into their own as industries in Hokkaido. Uh, but the biggest issue, I think, has more to do, I mean, mining has right, a lot of uh, negative negative impacts, right, uh, runoff from mining, especially in the, in the 1800s, has involved uh, a lot of water, right, uh, to take away the, uh, well, water is required for lots of things in mining, but it's, 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 it's partially required because when you mine, you have to go through water to get to the rocks. 
and it has to go somewhere, right? So all this water goes in the rivers, and it creates uh, issues for health of people living nearby. But the biggest issue for the Ainu uh, is fishing. The Ainu uh, are very reliant upon uh, fish for, for, for their livelihood. Uh, they're hunters more than they are farmers. Uh, and so again, the water wasn't the biggest issue. The biggest issue was uh, fishing. The Japanese uh, encroach upon those rights um, with a, a few new inventions. I wonder if something's missing. Um, yeah, here we go. Um, so the Japanese uh, are more efficient at, at, at fishing than the Ainu. Uh, and they develop more efficient technologies, which they bring to uh, Hokkaido or Ezo, uh, and, and they use. Uh, the, gill, the, the gill net, which is your space there, looks like this. It's a simple um, net that uh, is able to float and stay stationary as fish flow into it. Uh, is one innovation the Japanese bring. Uh, and the other is the pound trap, which essentially just leads fish into a larger um, netted uh, space. These are, are not super difficult to build. Japanese settlers uh, have materials. They have some imperi they have some shogunate, shogunate money as well to pay for uh, this. The shogun actually also ex uh, they encourage expansion with grants uh, of money and materials to go to Ezo. So this uh, expansion, uh, these technologies quickly overtake uh, population, also the fishing resources in Ezo. So uh, to make a long story longer, the population of Ezo, the Ainu people cannot compete. They cannot at all, uh, they're not able to uh, successfully compete with the Japanese. Uh, and they begin to uh, lose their fishing holes, their fishing uh, livelihood. <coughs> Um, and uh, in the 18, at, at the moment of, of the restoration, um, the, 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 the new government officially would like to make Hokkaido part of Japan. There was, a, there was actually a war in the, in the 1660s that, that, the, that the Ainu chieftains fought and lost uh, to try and resist colonization. It was happening slowly. Um, but by, by the 1860s, there was no uh, formal, uh, any sort of uh, blockage between Japan and its bending into um, Hokkaido. So they call it Hokkaido, uh, and at the absolute, absolutely the major restoration, uh, it becomes part of Japan officially. People uh, continue to suffer because right after they do this, they also divide the land into parcels that are private property, uh, and as a as a as a uh, culture that has relied upon uh, common pool resources, um, there's no they have no proof of land deeds, they have no you know they have no uh, no concept no concept of, of what this is supposed to mean. So the Japanese are able to go in and buy these private uh, lots uh, and settle and push the uh, Ainu out. It's actually a very sad story that uh, has been written about a lot in terms of comparison with the American uh, Indian history as well. Um, so late 1969, Japan includes Hokkaido. And a decade later, it will also include Okinawa, um, the former king of Ryukyu. So now let's talk about what's happening in Japan itself. Um, what's happening in Japan itself uh, as it expands uh, is that there's a larger desire for expansion. We talked about resources being sometimes limited, right, or being exhausted. Um, but uh, there's, uh, there's also a, a desire to use resources, uh, manpower, in ways that are productive and efficient uh, as well. Um, so let's talk about the Shimazu down here. Uh, in Satsuma. So the major restoration is, is very good for Satsuma and that they're able to acquire, as you'll recall, a lot of foreign technology, foreign weapons. Uh, they've had experience with Westerns before, and so they also uh, have some, you know, uh, Western knowledge is, is quite prevalent in, in, in Kagoshima. And the leaders of the major restoration among them, the uh, Satsuma samurai, are, are among the top, you know, handful of leaders who are leading things in, in uh, the, the new government. Uh, but Satsuma has also quite strong traditional uh, ties to its history, the culture of um, the samurai culture, right? Um, and th they begin uh, these same middle level uh, samurai who become uh, sort of vice prime ministers and things in the, in the new government uh, become worried about over westernization. Too much of the West losing Japan's uh, traditional culture 
And the, the Satsuma samurai, kind of like those in, in Aizu, uh, they, were, they were raised you know, for two centuries with very strong ideas about uh, manhood and about bravery uh, and about, uh, about virtue. Uh, and these things are hard to just overnight uh, erase, despite the, the rush to Western eyes. So they call upon these leaders, in particular, Sega Takamori, uh, on, on the right there, to uh, intervene and maintain a Japanese-ness, right, a Japanese national identity. Uh, this was also where uh, they were, um, for example, trying to purify Japan of, of the Chinese-ness, and they persecuted Buddhists, if you recall. Uh, in the 1860s, so all these things are still are still very present, despite Japan's westernization, led by in part Satsuma leaders. Uh, the, another issue is the samurai Satsuma want to stay samurai. The new government is trying very quickly to turn everyone into citizens uh, and into commoners, unless they are part of the uh, the very very elite, right, the, the, the daimyo or members of the imperial court, who get uh, a title of peer or uh, or, or nobility, aristocracy. Uh, so as you can imagine, the samurai uh, Satsuma, uh, who are on the winning side, in fact, of the restoration, uh, are feeling a little bit chipped. We don't get to be samurai anymore. What does this mean? Right? And with the creation of a new army of conscripts, the whole country is going to be holding uh, rifles and fighting for Japan. What are our skills worth? What is our history worth? They have these important questions. In 1872 and 73, there is uh, the, 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 the imperial family is waiting for Korea to send, one, uh, send an embassy, right, as a, a mission, uh, which they're supposed to do, if we recall, right, the Japan's world order. It requires its trade partners to come and visit and bring gifts on big, on big events. This major restoration is a pretty big event, right, the imperial restoration. Uh, but no one from Korea comes. There's no... Uh, no one comes, and they even um, re replied to, le to letters of asking them to come, saying that they're not, they're not going to come. Uh, I'm not sure of all the reasons behind that, but part of it has to do with their belief that this was not uh, a, a fully legitimate takeover of power. Uh, and also, there's also some internal issues between different factions in, in the Korean uh, royal family. So when this doesn't happen, uh, Sega Takamori, who is, uh, what is his title now? Uh, He's on the Privy Council. Anyway, he, he's, he's, um, he knows what's happening. Uh, and he sees an opportunity here to uh, uh, sort of reinstate Japan's ties to Korea or make them stronger, but also to put all these samurai in Satsuma to good use who are frustrated. Uh, his goal is essentially to provoke war with Korea, and then when Korea responds, to go punish Korea, uh, and then to colonize Korea if necessary. Uh, that is his goal. And he's, he's thinking about, this is called the Seikamadon, which uh, more or less is the, the, the debate about making uh, Korea a, a Japan enemy. Um, the samurai as a class, right, have, between 1871 and 1876, will lose all of their privileges, they'll, they'll lose their swords, they'll lose their top knots. Have you guys seen the movie, The, the, the Last Samurai? Yeah. Uh, the scene where um, the son of the figure who more or less is uh, designed sort of after Sai Takamori has his, his top knot cut, cut off in the street uh, in the new, I think probably actually in Yokohama. But anyway, he has this happen to him, and it's a very moving scene. If you, have, if you, if you avoid the, 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 sort of the, this kind of this Tom Cruise movie, you know, I understand, but um, it's really a, a good movie, especially that part, that scene. Uh, it illustrates what's happening to the samurai class. They're frustrated. They don't have a job. Their skills are, are no longer useful. Um, as you saw with Shiba Goro right there, they're confused as to the future in this new Japan. Uh, and they're restless, and they, but they also know how to fight, right? And so there's a danger of them perhaps even creating a revolution in Japan to take back some of their authority. Who knows, right? The, the, who, anything goes here. So to uh, diffuse this possible situation, uh, I think the idea of Sai Takamori to, to put these samurai to use, it makes a lot of sense. Uh, he makes this proposition to do this, um, and this actually lasts for a few years. Um, it is, in the end, rejected, and we'll we have a slide on that at the end, but um, th that's his idea. In the meantime, the same samurai from uh, Kagoshima get a small break. Uh, I think about 78 or so uh, Taiwan, uh, uh, um, Okinawan fishermen 
uh, the year before, um, are they, tr they traveled to Taiwan and Taiwanese um, Abor Aborigines who are um, Taiwan has Chinese residents uh, who um, many of whom came along with the, uh, at the end of the, the, the Ming Dynasty to Taiwan as well as Aborigines who are not uh, Chinese uh, ethnically Chinese uh, Han Chinese I should say um, they attacked these Okinawan uh, sailors and they massacred them uh, Okinawa had been part of Japan for you know three years right but this was a this was a, uh, a big affront to Japan or so the, pa the papers said so the government said uh, and so the samurai from Satsuma uh, who had been in charge of the, the Okinawan connection throughout the Edo period took it upon themselves to go and punish Taiwan for killing Japanese sailors uh, so the brother of, of Saigo Takamori um, actually is the leader of this group uh, and they go and they take uh, boats and they attack Taiwan. They they punish the Taiwanese. Uh, they, they 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 threaten and win a very short war. Uh, this finalizes Japan's claim to Okinawa as part of Japan. There's no there's no doubt about that anywhere uh, in terms of China's possible claims on Okinawa on Okinawa. And it also gets um, the Chinese also pay a very large in indemnity uh, for the loss of lives of these sailors. So this is a big moment for Japan in national policy. Ta um, Taiwan uh, will then uh, sort of be back in, Japan, in Japan's largest uh, sphere of influence. Uh, but thinking about Okinawa, the uh, king of Okinawa, uh, Shotai, uh, is asked uh, very politely to abdicate, uh, become part of, uh, of Japanese um, the Japanese no, noble class. Uh, he, go, he gets to go to the capital and live there if he wants to, which he, he's forced to do that. Um, and this officially pulls Okinawa into Japan, and, and they lose their leader. Um, back to Saigata uh His own compatriot from Satsuma, uh, Okubo, uh, he's against this. But the idea of Japan colonizing Korea. Uh, it's too early, uh, it's, it's too dangerous. Uh, he rejects this plan. And at this point in time, uh, Okubo is one of the people who has the emperor's ear. And the emperor uh, does not contradict him. And so this mission never happens. And this leads to the decision of Saito Komori to resign from the Council of State, the uh, Daijo, um, of which he's a part. And then he goes back to Satsuma. Uh, and plots a rebellion. He opens, he opens, a, he opens a military school to uh, reinstill the values of Satsuma and the samurai of Satsuma. Uh, and he's sort of just waiting. Uh, and actually, samurai from other parts of Kyushu who are also frustrated and worried, they, they flock to this school. So that by, the 18, by 1876 or so, uh, he does have an army. Uh, and when it becomes clear that there will be no uh, after the the, the, the the sort of finishing blow, right, to take away uh, samurai status in, in, in 76, they uh, plot a rebellion. The rebellion uh, marches with uh, several, th several tens of thousands of soldiers, samurai soldiers, up through uh, Kyushu, but the imperial forces descend and they meet in Komoto and the imperial forces uh, defeat the forces of Satsuma and other allied Samurai, uh, the scene in the last samurai where there's like the howlets are going off and the samurai are on their horses. I mean, that's that's horse wash. We have we have samurai, but they have guns. Uh, they are fighting. Just had fewer guns. They weren't trained. Uh, they weren't working uh, in the modern military formation, so they lost. But this battle was not a battle between uh, firearms and samurai uh, shooting bows and arrows, um, as the film depicts. Um, Uh, what does happen, uh, and this is part, it's part of what frustrates uh, Saito Komori, um, is the Japanese have a different idea. And it, they actually leave him out of this. He's, he's in, in, in Kagoshima. He's not part of this new plan. Uh, the new plan is to send uh, a Japanese warship, Unyo, uh, into uh, 
the, uh, the Kangwa, which is a, an island um, just off of the coast of Korea, um, from which the Koreans have killed several um, uh, several countries, um, members who have tried to, to enter Korea, uh, Westerners in particular uh, from Russia and in, in the United States. So the Japanese send a warship knowing that this is going to lead to uh, an attack. When the Unyo is attacked, uh, the Japanese use this as an excuse to uh, then invade, to, to, to threaten to invade Korea. Uh, this is a, this is a, um, we call gumbo diplomacy. Does this ring a bell at all? Like, so when did the Japanese uh, see this, 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 this kind of, um, of, of strategy at work in Japan? David? Yeah. Matthew Perry. Right? So this, this is textbook, you know, copying Matthew, uh, coming to Matthew Perry's uh, trip to Japan in 53. Um, in this case, um, the Japanese quickly overwhelm the Koreans uh, who give up and surrender and uh, they sign a treaty. And the Treaty of the Treaty of Kangwa, uh, which is a really big deal uh, because it officially um, opens Korea to trade with the world. <coughs> so while the West opened Japan, Korea, uh, Japan opened Korea, right? Uh, but using the, the, the same tactics. Um, in theory, at the beginning, uh, the, the goal of this treaty was to help uplift Korea. Right, to bring Korea on par with Japanese civilization, to have Japan have a, a better trading partner. Um, but the, the, so the, the treaty is, is not as punitive uh, or as uh, sort of unequal as the U.S. and Japan's uh, initial treaty of enmity and commerce. Uh, but it does get the, right, the Japanese to settle in port cities. Um, it, they bring uh, observers from uh, the Japanese court to uh, Korea to oversee, advise, help, guide, right, all these uh, very positive words. Um, and they forced Korea to open uh, three ports to trade, uh, including Incheon and Busan. Um, but the Korea does have sovereign rights. Right? It's a sovereign country. Uh, there was some confusion, right, because Korea has always been Chinese little brother, and they uh, have uh, relied upon China uh, often for for, for protection as well as other forms of, of influence and, 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 and help. Uh, so Japan officially severs Korea's official ties, right? Their ties with uh, China with this treaty uh, in, in 76. As you can imagine, uh, from the beginning, this is, this is a worry for China. China sees, uh, China has seen firsthand, right, uh, Western imperialism, what it looks like, and they, the Japanese imperialism looks very similar. They, um, they, they see this as a, as a sort of a road that will not lead uh, to a good outcome for China. Uh, and meanwhile, uh, in Korea, there are those who are embracing, <coughs> embracing Japanese uh, imperialism as a way to uplift Korea. Um, since we assume that colonization is, is always sort of resisted or fought against, and it's not always the case, right? Uh, you know, when, uh, as we'll see maybe in this class, we have time, the Indians um, are actually cheering for Japan as they're colonizing other countries um, initially, right? So, so colonization is, it's, um, you know, it's, it's a force that has mixed responses. And the, the most advanced, uh, the elite members of the young man class or the elite class, the, the educated literati class uh, are looking towards the West as a way to uh, improve their country, and they see Japan as sort of the bridge to that. So uh, a group led by Kim Okyun um, and his Gelapa, or his Party of Enlightenment, uh, embraces these changes uh, initially, right? Uh, and they welcome these Japanese advisors, uh, they open Japan, they, op they open Korea to Westerners who come in and who to open missionary schools and all these kinds of things. So it's really a very open moment for Korea. Um, so that's happening, uh, but in the background, uh, China and Japan are, are, you know, they're kind of eyeing each other. Uh, China is worried about losing uh, its, very, its, near, its nearest trade partner in the north uh, and what that might mean uh, for China as a whole. Um, and Japan is looking at the continent 
Uh, Japan is also worried about um, what some have called it the, the dagger of Korea uh, from the continent into the heart of Japan, right? Uh, that, that the Russians or Chinese could just at some point decide to run over through Korea into Japan, take over and take over, take over Japan. So there, there, there is this, this mutual distrust. Just to be clear on things, uh, the Prime Minister uh, Ito Hirorumi uh, and the Foreign Minister Li Hongzhang of China, uh, they meet uh, near Beijing, uh, and they establish the Li Ito Convention, which essentially is um, a promise that neither country will send troops uh, into Korea uh, without telling the other country first. If Korea needs help, of course, Japan will be there. But we'll have to notify China first, and vice versa for China. This uh, agreement is tested in, in, during the Dongak Rebellion, um, a peasant rebellion led by uh, a few members of the, of the, the, the literati class, uh, Chui Jeyu and others. Um, it's a peasant rebellion uh, that is essentially trying to make sense of all this change that's happening. Right? The, the, you know, Korea was a country with a very small uh, and very uh, separate um, elite class, uh, with mostly ties with the, with, the, with the royal family, and then the rest were all peasants, and there were also some slaves. So this society is all of a sudden open to the West, uh, flooded with new ideas, but also destabilized, uh, and angry at the Yangban class uh, for holding, holding uh, Korea back, but unsure sort of the, the way forward. So to sort of make a really big rebellion that leads to uh, 300,000 deaths uh, uh, into a small sort of soundbite, this revolution is about uh, trying to reestablish Korean uh, identity, uh, and it's about um, trying to um, merge Korean traditional religion with uh, independence and um, a more forward-looking country, sort of outlook on the country. Uh, so this rebellion uh, it, it takes over, right? And it, it spreads throughout the country. Um, Korea, the, the new government is really just trying to get to find its feet. They need help to put down this rebellion. This peasant rebellion. They, they, they're they unable themselves to do it, so they ask for help. The closest help is the China is from China, and so China does go to assist in, in putting down the the, the Dongak rebellion. Uh, but as you can imagine, the Japanese. Uh, are not happy with this. Uh, there's still debate as, uh, as to to what extent the Chinese notified the Japanese they were going to come help the Koreans. Um, but the reality is that the, the military force from China did go and help put down the, the, the rebellion, um, which you know is successfully uh, quelled. But the 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 outcome is uh, that Japan uh, announces the um, decision to go to war against China. This is a cartoon, uh, I think, from Punch Magazine, so a, a popular British publication uh, of the time, one of the top sort of most widely distributed uh, <laughs> weeklies of the time. What do you see happening here? And this, Johnny? Yeah, so China is a giant, right? The West has come to, to recognize you know, China for its size uh, in terms of its land mass, but also the, the population. Uh, and the culture of China also is the culture that dominates right, the East. Um, and so the West sees this uh, victory of Japan. Uh, Japan defeats, um, they defeat uh, China uh, in a little less than a year of fighting. Uh, Japan's new imperial forces are, you know, and the conscript, conscript army is tested uh, with, with their Western advisors. They've done a good job, right? And they're able to defeat China. Uh, and this defeat, uh, unlike future wars, uh, sometimes it, it, it's a real defeat. Uh, China loses this war. Um, <sighs> the 
the, this war was mostly fought in Korea, uh, or large part in Korea, and so it leaves a, a, in its wake uh, a trail of Korean deaths. Uh, many Koreans fought with the Chinese as well. Um, so this does not, uh, this war about China um, and Japan's ties, sorry, th th their own sort of conflict really was about Korea, and it really affected most Korea. Uh, Korea was crippled from this uh, fighting. Uh, this, the, the end result is that, and these are some battles here, but I'm not going on that today, was that um, Korea uh, is affirmed as an independent country. Uh, it's not a Chinese protector or anything like that. Um, and in exchange for, sort of, uh, in, in repayment for Japan's, uh, so Japan won a war, they get an indemnity. Um, uh, China admits to wrongdoing, right, uh, in starting this war or leading to this war, uh, and they pay the indemnity. But they also uh, cede to Japan uh, Liaodong Peninsula, um, which is um, Manchuria, more or less, uh, and Taiwan. So Taiwan in, in 1994, 95 becomes Japan's first sort of uh, real colony, right, which it had no. Uh, settlement or true ties before. Uh, so this is a big deal. Um, and China has to open four more treaty ports. Um, but Taiwan is the big deal here, I think I should mention. So the Japanese government in, Ta uh, government in Taiwan uh, is the government. So it's a, it's a, co a colonial government in, in Taiwan. Um, they codify things. They count people with the census. Uh, they count the land sizes, those kinds of things. Um, they institute Japanese language uh, in the schools. Um, these they, they use a lot of uh, you know police measures to um, what's the word to uh, create obedience. But on at the same time, they also bring uh, a lot of new financial investment. Uh, Bank of Taiwan is created with the Japanese colonial bank, uh, which finances uh, the creation of uh, sort of a, sh a sugar empire and a rice empire, uh, and tea and camphor to a smaller extent uh, empire in Taiwan that, that really goes back to Japan. So Japan now can get rice uh, from its, its rice colony, Korea, uh, sorry, Taiwan. Uh, the roads, railways, and harbors are maintained, maintained by, by, the, by the, the, this new government, which you know connects people. Uh, the postal service, the telegraph, are also in, you know they're also installed, and so these these changes they dramatically change life of people living in Taiwan, uh, and many actually embrace this. So what I'll say lastly is that um, we'll talk actually more I think next class about Japan's continuing and, and, and greater role in Korea. But the end result is that, that Japan colonizes Korea. First, it, it's a protectorate in 1905, and a colony in 1910, and it colonizes uh, Korea until 1945. Tomorrow, um, with uh, Mr. Higgins, we'll be discussing colonization, and you're going to read some things that, that describe colonization, uh, both how Japanese see it as well as how Koreans uh, experienced it uh, very briefly. So read those documents. Uh, it's not a lot of reading, I don't think. And then tomorrow, you'll be doing it, um, a debate. So you're asking me to actually, the question is, was colonization good for Korea? Uh, use your resources to prepare that, both sides of the debate, and then Mr. Higgins will give you a side to debate on uh, in class tomorrow. Okay? All right, thank you.